No, I neglected to say how much hard work the committee did actually to do this. They read 50 papers, talked about it, went, winnowed them down, and came up with honorable mention ones either. Wonderful work by both last year's committee and this year's committee, which is Sarah Tishkoff, Joe Alcock, Noah Rosenberg, and Allison Galvani. I'd like to invite Matthew up. On behalf of the society, I'd like to congratulate you on your prize. Yeah. There's obviously something about transferrin that gets you the Omen Prize. Uh, as you can see, uh, Matthew Barber's now in Utah. He also works on transferrin and published a remarkable paper in Science late last year, which again his CV is in the program book and I'm not going to waste Matthew's time, but ask him to get started and tell us even more about transferrin. Thank you. Um, so I'd just like to also start by, again, thanking Dr. Oman, who made this prize possible. How are we doing? Oh. Um, and the committee for the invitation to come out here and tell you a little about, bit about my work. Okay. Um, so you'll see some similar themes between my talk and Anne's talk with reference to transferrin and transparent receptors. Um, and host pathogen evolution, but in my case, um, some of the underlying biology is quite different, um, which I'll start with now. Um, so the first concept I want to talk about here is this idea of nutritional immunity. So fundamentally, simply the idea of nutritional immunity, it's an aspect of the innate immune system whereby we can starve microbial pathogens of essential nutrients and thereby um, halt their growth. And so my work and a lot of the work in this field um, thus far uh, has focused on nutritional immunity in the context of iron metabolism. And so the key points to know here are that iron is an essential nutrient not just for us, but also for our um, microbial pathogens and commensals. Um, but the trick here is that free iron in our bodies is kept at an amazingly low concentration. And that's due to the um, action of many iron binding proteins in our body, um, in the bloodstream, and extracellular fluids that essentially soak up this molecule and what that means is for any invading microbial pathogen, it finds itself in an iron-limited environment in the human body. Um, and so this is sort of the whole concept of nutritional immunity. Um, I'm just going to briefly go over some of the host components that make up this pathway. So in the beginning of my talk, I'll be telling you about transferrin, which um, the flip side of what Ann just told you about. It's a bloodstream um, glycoprotein that um, binds iron, delivers it to host cells through transferrin receptor, which is almost ubiquitously expressed on our cells. Um, but it also sequesters iron in the bloodstream, any free iron. Um, and so this was the story that some of you might be familiar with. In the end of my talk, I'll tell you about another unpublished story, in this case about a transferrin homolog called lactoferrin. Um, and so it performs a similar task, but in other bodily tissues like saliva, um, true to its name, it's in breast milk um, and other areas. There are also several heme binding proteins, hemoglobin, um, which can be released into the bloodstream by hemolysis, uh, hemopexin, which is a heme binding blood plasma protein. And so together, a lot of these host, and some that I'm not showing here, these host proteins provide a potent barrier to microbial growth. And so um, obviously there are many very successful um, cellular pathogens out there. And so one mechanism by which these um, pathogens, particularly the bacteria, use to get around host nutritional immunity is expression of their own unrelated um, receptors for these host factors, which allow them to bind, dock, extract the iron from these proteins, and then release them back into the extracellular space. And so the nature of this reaction has led to the term uh, iron piracy by bacterial pathogens. And so this idea has been around for several decades, and um, the sort of uh, medical and microbiology community, it's really gained some um, some impact, but nobody's really looked at how nutritional immunity, um, what the implications are from an evolutionary perspective. The other th point I should make with all these factors is that they all have day jobs, right? These are not dedicated immune genes. They have essential functions in oxygen transport or iron transport and metabolism. And so, you know, there's constraint here that may be imposed as well. Okay, so I'm going to be focusing on transferrin-like genes. Um, these are well conserved in metazoans generally. Um, and what I'm going to point out here is you can see the domain structure from, this is human serum transferrin as an example. 
It contains two primary domains, an N-lobe and a C-lobe, each of which binds a single iron ion. And these domains, this will be relevant later in my talk, they're not just functionally analogous, they're also evolutionarily and structurally homologous. Um, and this is thought to be due to an early duplication event that happened um, very early in the birth of this gene family. Okay, so again, I'll be speaking at first about um, serum transferrin, and then towards the end of my talk, a mammalian-specific transferrin homolog lactoferrin. Um, and so Anne gave a very nice introduction to the concept of positive selection, DNDS. I'm not going to belabor this point, but just um, to reiterate that in this case, if we sort of take a genome-wide view of protein coding genes across um, related species in this three-way comparison, in this case between mustachioed uh, comedian actors, chimpanzees, and rhesus macaques, um, it turns out most of the genes in our genome are subject to purifying selection, very low DNDS um, reflecting constraint. These tend to be enriched for housekeeping genes. And so what we're interested in in our lab are these genes that fall out on the right side of this curve with very high um, signatures of positive selection. And previous work in the field has demonstrated that, in general, this category is enriched for immunity factors, which makes sense based on the idea of an arms race between pathogens and hosts. Okay, so now to get into some of the data on transferrin. So instead of that three-way comparison I showed you before, um, how I started was looking across primates. So now we have apes, old world, and new world monkeys here at the bottom. And then just looking um, using phylogenetic analysis by maximum likelihood um, at DNDS across um, this phylogeny, we indeed see evidence of positive selection in several branches of the primate um, lineage. Um, what was really informative was instead of looking across the primate tree was, again, looking at the sites within transferrin that show evidence of positive selection. And what was really striking here was that of 18 sites um, that show evidence of selection in transferrin, 16 were in the C lobe and only two in the N lobe, right? And so I just told you that as far as the host is concerned, these domains are functionally, structurally homologous, right? So what's going on here? Um, having just heard Ann talk, I will tell you that um, with the exception of one site, I believe this one right here, these sites under selection don't correlate with um, the transferrin receptor. And it turns out that um, in primates, the, trans the host transferrin receptor is largely under uh, purifying selection, right? So what could be driving um, these signatures of positive selection? And just to cut sort of a long story short, I will tell you that um, these transferrin receptors that I alluded to in the beginning of my talk um, had previously been shown using biochemical means um, to only bind the C-lobe, to bind and extract iron from the C-lobe of transferrin. They were known to not bind the N-lobe. Um, also, just mentioned briefly, the pathogens that we're talking about that utilize this as an iron acquisition system are notable. So we've got um, species in Neisseria that cause gonorrhea and meningococcal disease, also Haemophilus influenzae. If you have kids, you've probably heard about the Hib vaccine, um, which can be dangerous in neonates. Um, the notable thing about these pathogens is that they're all very host restricted. So strains of Neisseria that infect humans only natively infect humans. Um, same with Haemophilus. This will come up a little bit later. Okay, so the other thing that was really um, beneficial to us was that shortly after starting this work, Susan Buchanan's lab at the NIH um, solved the crystal structure of one of these transferrin receptors from bacteria in complex with human transferrin. So in gray, we have um, TBPA, this is transferrin binding protein A from Neisseria meningitidis. Um, you can see it forms this um, barrel structure in the bacterial membrane. So what happens is it extracts iron from the C lobe transferrin, it gets translocated, and then into the bacterial periplasm where it can be used. Um, and so you can see it sort of forms this little like hand that transferrin sits in. And so when we overlay sites under selection across primates in this crystal structure, what we saw was that all 16 of these, in this case I'm showing the side chains of the amino acids under selection across primates, Every one of those 16 sites that I showed in the C lobe um, fits in this binding interface. So what this tells us is that over tens of millions of years of primate evolution, um, the major component driving the evolution of the C lobe of transferrin has probably been, trans can be attributed to transferrin TBPA or TBPA-like proteins. Okay, and so the next step um, in this was to sort of test the functional implications of this evolution um, in a biochemical setting. And so, I'm going to skip over the first part of the data um, for the sake of time, but what I'll tell you is that the approach I took was to purify transferrin proteins um, using bacillovirus expression system from a series of different primates, including humans. 
um, and then express uh, TBPA from different human pathogens in non-pathogenic K12 E. coli, which don't have their own transferrin receptors, and then use this as a system to test binding interactions directly. And so what was notable from that first set of experiments was that while human pathogen receptors can bind to human transferrin, they can also bind to gorilla transferrin, but as closely related as chimpanzees, transferrin couldn't interact with these receptors. So it implied there was some difference between humans and chimps that was dictating this binding difference. And so just to focus in on this right here, um, there are four substitutions uh, different between human and chimpanzee transferrin. All four are in the C lobe. Two are in sites that are under positive selection when we look across primates. And one of these actually is unique to chimpanzees in relation to humans and gorillas, and in fact, even to bonobos. So you can see the alignment here. Um, humans and other apes have a glutamic acid at position 591. And specifically in chimpanzees, there's been a lysine substitution. So they've got an acid to a base change at this site. Um, and you can see generally where it lies here, it's very proximal to the TBPA binding interface. And so to functionally test the importance of this single rapidly evolving um, site, here I'm showing you one of these, this is the raw data of one of these binding assays. So I'll just quickly explain the way this works is each of these dots are these E. coli expressing um, transferrin receptors from different pathogens. And then they're incubated either with a chemiluminescent um, human transferrin alone in the right, or uh, luminescent transferrin in combination with increasing concentrations of an unlabeled competitor transferrin that I express in purified. So what you can see is that as you lose signal um, with increasing concentration of the inhibitor, this correlates with the ability of this transferrin to bind to this receptor. And I've just summarized it on the right, if that was confusing at all. But what you can see from this assay is that the introduction of single glutamic acid to lysine substitution at position 591 is sufficient to impair this interaction between human transferrin and either of these pathogen receptors. And what was maybe the most fun experiment I've done um, as a postdoc was the reciprocal where we take chimpanzee transferrin, introduce a single chimp to human mutation, and now we confer the ability of human pathogen receptors to bind chimp transferrin with a single site. So at least in human chimp um, differences, it's coming down probably to the single substitution that's responsible. Um, and this was actually kind of surprising at the time because the group that crystallized this complex actually predicted that single amino acid substitutions in transferrin were not going to be sufficient to alter this interaction because it was a little hard to see, but there's a huge binding interface there that where TBPA is essentially grabbing onto transferrin. And so the fact that a single substitution was sufficient to have such a large effect here got me interested thinking about human variation in transferrin. And so what's been actually been known about for over 30 years is there's an abundant um, polymorphism of transferrin in human populations. I'm just showing the distribution of this allele. Um, this is 1,000 genomes data across different populations. Um, and this is called the C2 variant. So C2 um, causes a single non-synonymous uh, substitution at position 589. Most of us have a proline. The C2 variant has a serine at this position. Okay? So depending on population, it's anywhere from about 5% to 25% allele frequency in humans. Um, and so people have looked at this variant in the past in relation to Alzheimer's disease, where there's some link potentially with iron metabolism, but nobody's thought about this variant in the context of infection. The other thing I'll point out about the position of this variant, so you can see this wasn't one of the 16 that comes up under positive selection across primates. What you can see is that likely similar to within human populations, we see this toggling between proline and serine across the primate um, lineage, suggesting potentially that there's some kind of constraint at this position. You can see the valine next door to it is completely conserved. But what was really telling is that just two positions away is the site that dictates the difference between human and chimp transferrin that I just told you about, right? And so you can see the amazing variability of amino acids um, across primates at this position. And also just in the three-dimensional structure, we can see that this human variant lies in a position that's, again, very proximal to the TBPA binding interface. So to ask the million-dollar question, pure, made the protein, purified it, tested it in this assay. And so what you can see is that against Haemophilus influenzae transferrin receptor, the single human polymorphism is sufficient to impair this binding interaction, similar, similar to what we saw with chimpanzees, and as I mentioned before, gorilla transferrin binds. Okay? So, now we have potentially a functional um, reason why this uh, variant might exist in human populations. And so um, we're following up on this now. The other um, thing that I'll mention here 
and I'm going to skip over a bit of um, data from the end of the paper. You can go read it if you're interested. But this wasn't a universal observation. So it turns out that Neisseria transferrin receptors can bind to each variant equally, whereas many homophilus isolates um, don't bind to C2. So what this suggested is that there's underlying genetic variation inside of the pathogens that's responsible for this binding difference. Um, and so for anyone who's um, familiar with doing phylogenetics or evolutionary analysis in bacteria, you know that it, it's a total mess because doing these types of analyses depend on having at least a gene tree, if not a species tree, and because of homologous recombination, um, horizontal gene transfer, it really messes with your ability to have any kind of reliable phylogeny here. So my sort of naive approach was essentially a kitchen sink one where I said, if we just use many different algorithms to try and build gene trees, if we, there are methods we can use to account for recombination, and if we use all these different methods, run them through the same test for selection, are there still sites that come up no matter which tree we use? And so I did this, and we ended up with about 10 sites in, among Neisseria isolates, 10 sites among Haemophilus isolates, and this is what it looked like. So Neisseria sites with evidence of selection in orange, Haemophilus in blue or purple, and you can see again that for the large, in large part, they line again this interface um, with transferrin. And in at least one case, um, I've showed functionally that a single mutation um, in one of these sites is sufficient to um, alter transferrin binding reactions. And so I'll just summarize this first part of my talk with the animation that I had nothing, well, a little bit to do with. But it was made by Janet Awasa, who's in our biochemistry department. She also had that, did that um, nice uh, picture that was the first slide of my talk. So um, she has a lot of tools for doing these kinds of things if you're interested, called the Molecular Flipbook. Um, but the way in my brain we sort of imagine these arms races playing out in the case of transferrin, if we imagine, um, what you'll see here is if we're imagining transferrin evolving through time, um, you'll see the emergence of a pathogen, TBPA, and then adaptive mutations in the case of transferrin that um, remove this interaction, or in the case of the pathogen that reestablish that binding um, over time. And so this is sort of how I, in my mind, visualize um, these arms races playing out over time. And these are actual sites that we identified that are functionally important um, for binding and their position within the crystal structure. There we go. Okay. All right, so all that stuff's published. Um, you can go read it if you're interested. And in the rest of my time, I'm gonna tell you about an unpublished study um, that hopefully be somewhat familiar on um, lactoferrin. So just to quickly summarize, I mentioned lactoferrin is a transferrin homolog. It's specific to mammals. Some similarities between transferrin and lactoferrin, they both bind iron strongly. Here are the crystal structures. You can see they both have an N and a C lobe. Um, they both bind iron. They both contribute to nutritional immunity. There's been subfunctionalization where um, transferrin, oh, I should also mention that both of these proteins have also been shown to be targets of bacterial iron piracy. So analogous to TBPA, which binds transferrin, there are structurally and functionally related receptors in bacteria called LBPs that bind the lactoferrin C lobe. Um, so this might be a reason to, to think why there might be a similar arms race happening in lactoferrin that we saw in transferrin. There's also been subfunctionalization, so transferrin's in the bloodstream. Um, lactoferrin is in many body tissues, milk, saliva, I should also point out it's also a prevalent protein in secondary granules of neutrophils, so it gets released at sites of infection, sort of hinting at its new immune properties. Um, and so it, in addition to all of these functions, what's been shown is that lactoferrin um, is also um, antimicrobial um, completely out of the context of iron. So if it's not iron-loaded, it still inhibits microbial growth and also inhibits some viruses and tumor cells in some cases. And a lot of this has actually been attributed to sort of neo-functionalized um, activity in the lactoferrin end lobe. So actually pieces of the lactoferrin end lobe can even be released and function as antimicrobial peptides. They insert in pathogen membranes and, and mess them up. Um, so while we have some reason to believe that there might be something similar happening to transferrin, there's also these neo-functional um, attributes that have arisen in lactoferrin. And so um, just to quickly say, in this case, I was looking at a matching set of primate species for lactoferrin transferrin. This is a smaller 15 species panel compared to 21 as in before. And we do see evidence of positive selection in lactoferrin. Again, what was telling was looking at the sites under selection. So now in this case, with the smaller species panel, we have a subset of the sites in transferrin I showed you earlier. Again, all in the C lobe. Now if we look at the same set of species for lactoferrin, it was kind of surprising. So 
while some of these sites, again, we do see evidence of positive selection in the C lobe of lactoferrin, a lot of the action seems to be happening actually in the N lobe. And they're just showing you that um, overlaid with the crystal structures. Again, um, there's something pretty new going on here. So I already mentioned that the N lobe of lactoferrin seems to have acquired these new antimicrobial properties. It also binds LPS from gram-negative bacteria at the membrane. So positive selection could represent sort of an offensive strategy by the host to try and target a rapidly evolving pathogen. It could also potentially be a um, defensive strategy. We're still working this out. So again, here's just in this case the end lobe of lactoferrin with sites under selection marked in blue. And this is a co-crystal structure in this case of a um, streptomoniae protein called PSPA, pneumococcal surface protein A. So for any microbiologists or clinicians, you might be familiar with this. This is a major um, virulence factor in um, pneumococcal strep. It's a very abundant surface antigen, and it's a target of actually um, pneumococcal vaccines. And so what you can see is that um, strep pneumonia, PSPA, binds right at the interface where we see some of this positive selection happening in the, in the lactoferrin. Um, and the last um, bit of data I'll show you is now again looking at um, positive, or I'm sorry, variation of lactoferrin in human populations. So unlike transferrin, there's actually several variants um, in lactoferrin that are at reasonably high frequency. I'm just showing six here. All of these are above 1% um, allele frequency in humans. Um, and I got really excited by one um, at position 48 because this is um, a non-synonymous change, and it's in a site that's also subject to positive selection across primates. And so here's that one position marked in uh, magenta, the crystal structure. And it also shows this really fascinating um, po population distribution. So in some African populations like Yoruban, um, this ancestral allele is the arginine in this case, um, is at 99% allele frequency, um, and the lysine is only about 1% or so. Whereas in um, all non-African populations, and especially in, um, it seems like Europeans, there's just been, been this explosion of this um, variant in humans, in some cases up to 65, even 70% allele frequency. Um, and so for anybody who's interested also in archaic hominoids, I can tell you that from what I've looked at from Neanderthals, it actually looks like Neanderthal transferrin has the derived lysine at this position. So I can't comment yet on whether this represents potential introgression from Neanderthals into early humans. I'm not an expert on sort of um, human evolution, but we're collaborating with Lynn Jordy's lab at the University of Utah to look um, at this, as well as look for actual evidence of selection of lactoferrin um, in human populations. And so I'll just start to wrap up my talk by um, just saying that I'm probably preaching to the choir here on this, but I hope I've convinced you this is a sort of an interesting instance where by taking a wider evolutionary um, perspective, we've gained some insight um, from 40 million years of primate evolution um, in these two stories. Um, getting insight on the genetics of human disease and mechanisms by which we evade pathogens and pathogens adapt to us, um, as well as potential um, avenues for therapeutic intervention. And so in my ongoing work, I'm continuing to look not just at transferrin and lactoferrin, but other components of this host nutritional immunity pathway, other components of innate immunity, their, their evolution in response to bacteria, as well as experimental approaches to actually understand how bacteria um, can adapt in response to host um, species variability. And so with that, I'll just um, thank the members of my lab, especially my advisor hiding in the back there, Nels Eldy. Um, we have a lot of awesome collaborators at the University of Utah outside. Um, I'd like to thank my funding sources um, at NIH and Pew, as well as um, all of you for listening and supported the society. I'll take any questions if there's time. Did you uh, check whether these two sites result in the gain or loss of an O or N glycosylation site? Transfer? Yeah, so whether any of the sites under selection. So none, to my knowledge, none of the sites under selection are in sites that are glycosylated in transferrin. Um, and I also, so in that structure paper, they actually showed that the glycosylation of transferrin didn't strongly impact TBPA binding. But it would be interesting maybe to look in some other species if there's variable glycosylation you can imagine would mask that might be sort of a novel mechanism of adaptation, yeah. Is there any sequence or functional homology between this mechanism of iron capture 
and the mechanisms that are used in siderophores. Yeah, so um, I didn't sort of glossed over that. So siderophores are another mechanism of iron acquisition, um, primarily used in bacteria. These are small molecules similar to heme that are secreted. They bind iron from host proteins, and then there are receptors by the bacteria that take them back up. Um, so one place that we've looked in relation to potential conflicts with siderophores is siderocalin, so it's a host protein. It's also very um, prominent in neutrophils, and it binds in pterobactin in some classes of siderophores. So far, I have not seen evidence of selection in um, siderocalin, but what's really cool is that there are actually classes of siderophores that were previously called stealth siderophores. They're glycosylated, they don't get bound by the host protein, and um, so, you know, this is sort of an alternate adaptive mechanism on the part of bacteria, presumably, to modify their siderophores. Congratulate the two prize winners. It's been a remarkable afternoon. Young investors.